going to record to the cloud this time. And can I get permission to record also? Uh, you certainly may. Let me turn on uh, if your name would stop jumping around here. Uh, allow record. Anybody else want permission to record? Where are you recording to, Dan? The cloud? I, I'm recording to the cloud. Uh, and uh, Daryl's raising his hand for permission to record. And, uh, but other people are probably recording locally. I will obviously post this. Uh, recording to the cloud takes a little bit longer to process, um, but has some additional features. And I will post this up to YouTube when we're done. Michael and Winnick as well. Michael. Um, OK. Uh, and you're just showing off your fiber optic. Yeah, I am. Uh, allow record to Michael and um, the Mel wanted it, and I'm, you know, people. Okay, so good oh, morning. <laughs> Welcome to the newbie callers. Uh, let me let me look at the camera here. Good morning. Welcome to the newbie callers uh, Zoom chat. I'm uh, Don stepped back a little bit and let me organize this one. So um, morning to Don too. He's normally the person who does all of this stuff. Um, this morning we have Bruce Holmes, who is one of the success stories that those of us who have started new uh, clubs have looked to for inspiration. When we started the Petaluma Squares, which in the past two years went from zero to three squares and then back to zero with COVID. Um, <laughs> Bruce's, uh, Bruce's stuff was a, a huge inspiration to us. Um, his Caller Lab Knowledge page, which we will post the links to extensively. And so I am super excited to have him here this morning and he's going to talk to us for a while and then we will devolve into our usual discussion and we may even devolve into our usual discussion as he talks to us. But without further ado, let me turn it over to Bruce. Hello. Am I showing up on the screen now? You are showing you up are on the screen. Here. I've decided I will just do this blatantly at the beginning because otherwise I'm sure I will forget because I always do. Um, <clears throat> this is a plug. This is a book. It's called Becoming a Square Dance Caller, and it's 189 pages, <clears throat> and it's the book I really wish I'd had when I was getting started, and it tries to take somebody from the very beginning stages to actually being able to do it. <clears throat> Bruce, um, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear what the name of the book was for some reason. Becoming a Square Dance Caller. Okay, thank you. Um, there's something can I, that, can that I I've say, heard. Can I just say before you start that I've got the book, you sent it to me this summer, and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. So thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs> okay, put that in writing and send it to me. <laughs> um, Actually, I've got the book as well, and I've been working on it the last several weeks. And it is making much more sense than the first time I started reading it. I know. More. <laughs> oh, so it's a book you have to read twice. Great. Um, you know, well, if I don't see my own picture in the middle, I shouldn't worry about that, should I? No. No. Good. Well, yes. I, instead of instead of having to switch back and forth i'm going to show you one other thing while i've got the screen and then i'm going to move up to a powerpoint this is a called a trifold and you can actually get a little box to hold it in and put it up someplace and it's one of the things i'm going to mention and now you'll remember what they look like so I've heard people say that beginning callers should not teach classes because they're just not good enough. And the only people who should be teaching classes ideally is the old pros. And I think that's so completely wrong and misguided. I think it's a wonderful way to become a caller is to 
get yourself a class and start teaching it, you have to be kind and have fun with it. And you've got to be really well prepared. You got to spend the time and get yourself so that you're really ready for this. But if you'll do that, you can be very successful at it. I have been in a class with a very accomplished caller who could get angry and be unkind. And I'd much rather have a beginner who had the heart for it and the good feelings and the good vibes. And I've seen them succeed quite well. Um, and it's a wonderful way to learn how to be a caller because you'd have to take it a step at a time. And each week you get a little bit more of what you need to know. And you only have to do what you've already practiced in the, in the week before. So it works out just fine. And uh, I hope nobody will feel hindered by the fact that they're just getting started. So with that said, I want to share a screen and go through a PowerPoint presentation. Just so I'll stay on track and won't waste a lot of time. Okay. The basic idea here is that we're doing a number of things wrong. And that if we don't do those and do everything right, it works like a charm. It, this was not a hard thing I did. Um, I started out a, a square dance club in September of 2016. By summer of 2017, the club was formed. And right now we've got somewhere in the 90s with the club membership. And um, I want you to put up with hearing my history and learning the biases that I picked up because I think they were critical to making this thing work for me. Okay. My keys aren't working, which is why we're just sitting here for right now. Will that change? No, it will not. I am not seeing a change. Have Whatever you did made that little blue bar across the top disappear, so we're in full screen mode. Well, that's a big accomplishment. There we go. There we go. Right, 8%. We're in here now. This is going to just be right. smooth. 8% is our annual decline in square dancing. And this is, um, this is 1976, Anaheim, California. We had 39,000 people in the US. I know a lot of you are from Australia. Um, 2018, I was in Kansas City and we had 3,000. I mean, we're going the wrong direction. I just want to acknowledge that very little of this is original thinking. I've heard countless people saying the same thing. The only reason I'm doing this presentation is that I took what I've been hearing and gave it a shot. A lot of people have made enormous contributions to the success of the club and others have done something similar with similar results. So it does work. Uh, almost anyone could have done this. Nine years ago, I was not a caller. These days I'm adequate. I'd like to think I'm a good teacher and I'm mostly singing key, that helps. I was willing to put in the hours and I had a lot of help and I'm a nice guy. That's really all I've got going for me. And there are a lot of nice people in the world. And if you're, if you're one of them, you should be able to pull this off. Uh, I took a square dance class when I was 11. This was out in California. <coughs> then the family moved east and the dancing ended. In my early 20s, <coughs> I got involved in folk dancing. And within a couple of years, I was teaching a Friday night class in Evanston, Illinois. And one Friday night, a girl showed up. And you can imagine the rest of it. Um, she had been to a place called Kentucky Dance Institute. And they had a week-long session each summer. And she wanted to go to it with me. So we went. But the trouble was, I was expected to square dance for an hour every day. And I didn't want to. And I, I think I mentioned that I had 
been a square dancer when I was 11 years old and I loved it. And it amazes me now that I had forgotten everything that I knew about it. I had forgotten I'd ever done it. All I had was what I picked up out of the ether. Um, and I thought it was stupid and for Hicks. And this is the reason why. I, there's a general consensus about square dancing. I mentioned to a, a neighbor just recently, have you ever tried square dancing? And they looked like I had insulted them. We have a very bad image and here's the reason why. That's it, right there. Uh, if you, this is quite ubiquitous, this picture. If you ever um, go to a park district and they put a flower for you, that's the image they'll find on the internet. That's the image they'll use. Um, we have a local group called MCASD, which is our umbrella organization. That's the image they use. When some of us wanted to change it to something else, oh, it was such a battle and no one wanted it. They want to hold on to that past, they want to hold on to that image. And that image just does all sorts of bad notations for a lot of us. Um, I think it begins with this. This is a very dear lady. Her name is Minnie Pearl. She's a comedian. She's going for laughs. And this is her with the, uh, the full regalia on. It's Johnny Cash and Minnie and Glenn Campbell. And this was Hee Haw. The show was not very urban and erudite. It was low class and stupid. The humor was really bad. And I used to watch it because I like country music. But the image of Hee Haw, there it is, there's Teresa Russell. Look at that outfit she's got on. The belt isn't quite broad enough. But other than that, that's a perfect square dance outfit. I don't know why we adopted this, but it has killed us. Um, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. The KDI, we square danced all week and had a blast. I just discovered once again that I love the stuff. Uh, when we got home, we turned to each other and said, should we take lessons? And uh, then she said the famous words, okay, let's do it, but I'm not gonna wear the crinolines. That's a direct quote. That's exactly what she said. Remember those words. We took lessons with fascinating singles. After a few years, we were doing C1 in a private home. By now we were married, my fiance and I. A child showed up, we carried the kid as we danced, more kids, the kids got heavier, a small scandal happened, the group disbanded. And that was the end of our dancing, it's square dancing. A decade later, the wife fell in love with somebody else and that was the end of the marriage. And a year later, I met someone new at English country dancing. And we started doing some barn dancing. And then one day she asked the question, have you ever tried square dancing? And I went into shock and I said, oh my God, I love square dancing we ought to do it. And she said, and I swear to you, she said exactly these words. Okay, but I'm not gonna wear the crinolines. And I knew then what crinolines were. First time when my first wife said, I didn't know what a crinoline was. So I just, sure. Now I knew, fine. Um, after nine months of lessons, we went to the Detroit National in 2011. Thursday morning, I went out and bought two cowboy shirts. And then I went to a seminar on how to promote square dancing, how to get it to grow. And it wasn't really two people at the front of the room talking. It was open to the floor. A lot of people got up and made a contribution. Very quickly in the hour, a woman got up and said, I cannot get any of my women friends to try square dancing with me. 
They all insist that it is the most horrendous look they'd ever seen. They wouldn't be caught dead looking like that. And they won't try it. They won't give it a chance. And then, of course, over the next hour, I would say at least 10 people, 10 other women, got up and said pretty much the same thing. They cannot get their friends to try square dancing because of the way we look. And I left that session thinking I wish I hadn't bought the uh, square dance shirts because that seems to be part of the problem and we can't just keep shooting ourselves in the foot. So one of the things I had in mind was trying to avoid the negative images we picked up. Um, I don't wear cowboy sh shirts. I don't wear cowboy boots. I don't wear a cowboy hat. I don't try and do anything that reminds people of, of what they think square dancing is about. Um, the other problems we have are you only get to start lessons in September. At least that's how we do it in the, in the USA. And the lessons take too long. Typically they're nine months and that's forever. And finally, it's kind of hard to learn. Um, for all of us, it's not. You know, we're the people who was like, oh, this is so cool, it makes total sense. There's a lot of people who don't react that way to square dancing. 20% is, I think I've had enough experience to say this, 20% really can't get it. They may want to get it, they may try very hard, it's, it's not going to work out terribly well. 20% have a very hard time, but, but if you stay at it long enough, they can get it. 20% are your all-stars who would get it if you were a bad teacher and did it in half the time, they'd still manage it. And 40% will succeed if given enough time, which we rarely do. We're always on a schedule. We're always meeting someone else's timeline. Um, no caller I know of believes the average person can learn plus in nine months. And yet that's how it's offered in Chicago because all the plus clubs, all the clubs in Chicago are plus clubs. And plus clubs need plus dancers. And they work something out with the park district and the park district has from September through May and you've got nine months and you better do it in the nine months or forget it or else you end up with people who can't join your club at the end of the nine months, which is what you're desperate for. And it doesn't work. Uh, typically in a group of say 12, six drop out. It doesn't suit them. And it's been nine months and somebody had to go off to Florida and they're gone for a month and then they come back and they can't get back into it again. Uh, all sorts of reasons people fall out or they, they hurt themselves or kind of make it through to the end. Two, if you're lucky, totally get it and thrive. And the four that are left uh, kind of make it and don't dance over the summer. And they come back in September and repeatedly crash the square. And on the way home in the car, one of them says, boy, I, that was awful. And the other one says, I don't want to go back. And then the next thing you know, they, they're out of square dancing. And that's the trouble the club I was with nine years ago uh, was having. And so what we did was, um, we created an ad hoc committee. We had to create plus dancers. We couldn't offer a lower level without offering dances at that level. And we couldn't do that without doubling our workload. And we weren't willing to do that. Uh, our square dancers were already sitting out half of our regular dances so the round dancers could dance. So if we just divided up the square dancing portion of it into plus and say mainstream, we'd not be down to maybe half an hour of plus each night. That wasn't gonna work. We lacked the strength and resources to do a second series of dances at a lower level. We had no solution. We tried all sorts of things. We brought in uh, a new caller. We had two callers at each, each of our lessons. 
I became one of them. Um, we developed new advertising. We scoured the available materials from Color Lab for ideas, and we got a lot of good ideas from that. We offered intro parties with lots of desserts. We did better, class size doubled. But the ultimate results were pretty much the same. We lose a lot of the people we had, and they were enthusiastic, and they were having fun. And all of a sudden, you're at the end of the year, and not a lot to show for it. Um, so then we started examining this idea of Club 50. Color Lab now calls it SSD, which I think is a terribly anemic way to describe anything. It stands for social square dancing at this point. Uh, the club only had a handful of round dancers. And somebody one day finally <laughs> said the terrible words, could we drop the round dancing? And we decided to risk it. <clears throat> we warned our 50 some members that next season we wouldn't be round dancing. The five or six round dancers quit and told us we were destroying the club. We began teaching club 50 classes twice a year, which meant we could have twice as much happening each year uh, in terms of students getting graduated. We, um, we went to a high low approach at the dances. We'd start out with club 50, we switched to plus, club 50 plus tips alternated. By the end of that year, Glenview had 90 members. So we didn't kill the club. One of the things that clubs do now, at least in our area, is they re rely on stealing and retrieving. They figure if you have a limited number of people and the clubs are just shrinking at a rapid rate, the only solution is to get everybody coming around extra dances. And so you go to other dances and you, you fill up the floor and you keep that club alive. And Joy and I live in Evanston along the lakefront, just north of Chicago. <clears throat> and most dances are at least an hour's drive away. So we drive for an hour, we dance for an hour. The rest of the time there at the two hour dance would be watching other people round dance and then we drive home for an hour. So we'd have four hours, one hour of dancing, and that got old really fast. And this is how we're gonna keep square dancing alive. The better solution is to start up more, more clubs and just have your own club locally. So I decided to do that. I went around all the park districts in my little neck of the woods, and, um, they were all enthusiastic about the, the idea of offering square dance lessons. I, I later got to know them better. And one day, one of them said to me, you know, we thought you'd never, this, this wasn't going to work. We just did it because we thought we ought to. And then about two months later, the other park district said the same thing to me. And their, their square dance class was the most well-attended one they had in the adult group. So, I got three different square, uh, park districts to offer to hold the classes. I figured if I had to, I'd do all three nights, but I also figured one of them might not work. Maybe two of them might not work. I wanted at least one to work. One of them did not work. They, they canceled it a week before. I've since learned that most of these classes, they don't uh, get signed up for until the day of the class. So who knows what might have happened if they hadn't been nervous about leaving it on the schedule. Um, so I was offering classes that first year, two nights a week. One was Monday, one was Wednesday, I believe, if I remember correctly. The park districts put out material to advertise the lessons and those did not do any good for us. They put, us, they put us on the same page with the ballerina classes for the little kids. And I don't know if anyone ever saw any of that stuff, but I put up a lot of posters. I went around and I, I did the poster routine and that brought them in. And I offered free intro parties. That's one of the things we learned at Glenview. Free intro parties help. And I think that having no club behind me might've been a blessing. And that's because 
I hope this doesn't sound too negative, but I didn't want my future students to see square dancing as it was. Because what you see is you go in and there's this room and there's a lot of people in their 70s and 80s, and they're all in these funny costumes. And I thought that alone will kill it. So I didn't go around asking my friends at Glenview to come out for this thing. I didn't want them showing up in, in the outfits. I didn't want the age to be an issue. I'm old enough as it is. I'm 74 now. But I was only one guy. So, you know, I got away with it. I had a lot of younger people showing up and the average age of the club is around 50. And I think if I'd had an old people's home staring them in the face when they showed up for the intro parties, I would have lost that. So, um, all right, I'm gonna just, first of all, take a look at the picture. Notice that there's no weird outfits, okay? No cowboy suits. Notice what I say if I put the upper left-hand corner. Today's square dancing, and I use today's literal specifically, it's not what you think. Because my belief is that anybody who sees a poster about square dancing is going to immediately just start to turn away. Because they know what square dancing is. They had it in, in grade school. They know what dosido -si -do is. They remember it from grade school. But they also have this idea that it's not for intelligent people. And I want to read through this, this material here and tell you why I did it. Today's square, today's square dancing does not involve really petticoats, cowboy outfits, and old fashioned music. We wear what we like and dance to everything from the Beatles to modern country to pop favorites. It's not even dancing, it's just walking to music. Now, right there, I'm trying to get a hold of the guys because they're afraid to dance. More for the guys. It's a little like football, except without the concussions. You've got formations. You've got a team around you. You've got plays sent in by the caller. The challenge is, can you run your route successfully? Now, granted, the team is co-ed, but that's a positive feature. The team is made up of couples and singles, no partner required. I'm getting the people who are worried about coming alone there. You're working together with seven other people, and when you nail the outcome, it's really quite exhilarating. All that is necessary is the ability to sustain a fast walking pace. I put that in because I had people showing up who should have been in rehab, and a positive attitude. And now I'm going to just go ahead and ask for what I really want. A quick mind and the love of a good puzzle can also help. If you enjoyed geometry in high school, you'll get a kick out of this stuff. It doesn't help you to get just anybody in there. It helps if you get the people who are going to succeed at this. So, postering, uh, store windows, store bulletin boards. You can usually tell <clears throat> if a store is going to let you put their your, your poster in the window, they've got other posters there. If you don't see the other posters, they're probably going to say no, because they've been asked before. Um, if they don't have it, you might want to check in the back of the store and see if there's a bulletin board. Coffee shops, of course, are great. Starbucks, every Starbucks in the country has a, a bulletin board. But the posters that get put up at Starbucks don't last long. You have to go back a couple of days later and put it up again and then again. Um, train stations, especially ones with a waiting room, are wonderful. Uh, especially if they've got the waiting room, because then you can put stuff out on a table and you can have things that they can take home with them. Those trifolds I showed you in the beginning, I always put those in the waiting rooms of the train stations. Civic centers, community centers, anywhere where they're offering classes for the community, libraries, and then the, my final admission, admission, that's not weak. My final piece of advice is that you keep track of your responses. In other words, you may want to put a certain thing in the community centers and a certain, and maybe even alternate the posters. 
And then when they're coming in to sign up for the intro party, ask them, where, where did you see the, the poster? Oh, which, which poster do you think you saw? Find out which poster is working for you. You may have more than one poster if you're smart. And learn from what you've done in your advertising. There's other things you can try, like on the web and stuff. And I kept hoping they'd, they'd work for us because they're cheap. And uh, not a lot. I think everyone keeps thinking that, that that's going to be the, the newest thing that will take care of everything for our advertising needs. And in my experience, that hasn't happened yet. Although when it does happen, it's a freebie and you didn't have to go out work in the streets. So it's nice, but I wouldn't count on it. This is a poster from our a later class. And I want to point out a few things about it. Notice we didn't use a, a picture of people square dancing in this. Um, notice that we have two classes listed, Monday and Wednesday. And notice that we have a list of five intro parties that they can go to. So there's a lot of good things here, but the one thing I would point out is that we have an advertising guy in the club and he looked at it and said, you know, that should have been a picture of people square dancing with smiles on their faces. And lo and behold, this one didn't pull that well. It was worth a try, but it has lots of white space, which is what they'll all tell you about uh, putting a poster together. But the ones I did without a lot of white space, but with the comments, did pretty good. Okay, free intros. The first thing is you use the most modern music you can find. I would never show up dressed like a cowboy. Understand that people want to dance with people their own age. If your club is old, that gives the impression this is an old people's activity. And then you have a mountain to climb. Uh, I'm old, but I didn't have a, I'm pretty spry for what it's worth. Do not reinforce negative stereotypes. Uh, I do not teach them do si do. I just avoid it like the plague because it's gonna remind them that they think they know what square dancing is and that that's what this is. I don't want them to think that. Um, here's the way I do it. I don't make squares right off. I've been in intro parties where the caller insisted on squares and people keep coming in late, you know. So every minute, well, every couple of minutes, there'd be a new people and you'd have to stop everything and make the square all over again. And now we need a new square back there and everything would grind to a halt. Instead, I started in a big circle, circle left, circle right. Um, <clears throat> initially, when I'm doing this, I use a head mic so I can get in with them and kibitz with them and make jokes and get them smiling. And then here's the moment that I think is the key to everything. When we get to forward and back, I insist on them making noise and I just cajole them into getting to the point where they're making a lot of noise. Once you've broken that barrier, you can keep it going. Ask them if they succeeded, let them celebrate. And once they know that they're supposed to make noise, they will celebrate. They will just be yelling and hooting and hollering they won't understand it when they leave, they'll have smiles on their faces and they'll, they'll not really understand why they're having so much fun. But I think the noise is part of it. So I'm gonna recommend that. Um, we, we teach them partners, partners, corners, arm turns, alaman left, Sicilian circles, we do pass through, circle left, pass through, star through, do stars, you know, right hand star, left hand star. And only then after about 20 minutes do we start making squares because by then things have gotten kind of solidified. You are not, not have a lot of people coming in the door at that point. And I'm also gonna recommend grand squares because the biggest problem beginners have is remembering what the heck to do with that call. You know, you put two or three calls together even though they're very simple, easy calls and they can't remember what the calls were. But if you, one of the things you teach them is grand squares, you can use grand square for the first half of a verse and then something simple to finish it off. And 
they once they've started on the grand square, they've they've learned it, and they can finish it. Um, and the, there's a way to teach grand squares. I hope everyone knows it, where you you don't separate them out into sides and heads, where you simply have everyone turn and face the partner, turn and face their opposite partner, opposite partner, opposite. That's all it is. That's all the grand square is. If you're facing somebody and you're close, back up. If you're far away from somebody, you walk forward. And after every three steps, you pivot to face the other person you're all allowed to look at. If you know how to teach a grand square that way, it works like a charm. You can teach it in a couple of minutes at the most. Um, <clears throat> first year, there were next to no angels. Um, I often had to call from the square if somebody was missing. We, di we didn't have enough people or something. I could always call on my uh, girlfriend, Joy. I used rectangles when needed. Um, somehow we got through it without having a lot of angels. Um, you will always have the problem of more women being interested than men. And so right from the beginning, I would tell them that if you learn this stuff from both positions, you will know it 10 times better. And I had all the women at least try it once, switching positions. And if they could get it, they'd alternate each week. If they couldn't, you just drop it like a hot potato and you wouldn't ask them to do it again. Some, some girls can get it and some girls couldn't. But as a result of that, in our club, I would say 60% of the women can dance both parts. And it solves a lot of problems by being able to do that. Um, I taught two Club 50 classes, both in the spring and in the fall. So by the end of the first year, I had four classes I'd graduated. So that was like, it was over 30 people. And that summer, I'd asked, I asked who wanted to st uh, start a square dance club. We had a meeting at my house and uh, half of the possible people showed up. And it was a remarkable amount of enthusiasm and energy. <clears throat> I find myself wondering if some of that was because there was no club. Uh, we weren't asking someone to take over old responsibilities. There was no, already, no one already in place. The team couldn't just leave it to somebody else. I was volunteer or it wouldn't happen. And we got a lot of responses. A lot of people pitched in. We decided dues would be $90 and pay for seven dances and the badges. We started at 28 members. Uh, membership went up about 20 members a year. It's in the 90s now. And dues were down to $75 for nine dances. Uh, lesson support. Each week, they get an email with links to Taminations, so they can go watch it on the web if they want. Each student gets a collection of flashcards. Um, they have the ability to attend lessons outside of class because there's a concurrent class going on. If they can't make it Monday, they can come Wednesday. If they want to come to both classes, they can. Why not? Get, let them get the floor time in. Um, we also had in my very first class, we had a guy who obviously wanted to teach. You know, every time somebody had a question at the break, he'd be grabbing them and explaining it to them. And I, you know, I listened in. I, I had a, an attitude that I read people who say, don't let the students teach. And I think that's bonkers. I always listened in if somebody was teaching something and made sure they were doing it right. But I'd let them do it. And it got a lot of people really excited about um, teaching because they enjoy it. It's obvious that they're doing it well and that they're, they could be good at it. And at this point, we have, there are four new callers teaching classes for North Shore Squares. I'm not teaching a class, obviously, <laughs> because of the pandemic. But we have four people who have become callers from the 90 uh, who are students um, or class members or club members. 
And it's because I let them try their hand at it. One, the first one who, who got really excited about it started offering Saturday drill sessions because he wanted a chance to do some calling. And so he offered this for free. And people could come on a Saturday and get some extra work in. Club has also created video lessons and they're available on the North Shore Square's website. And each student receives a 42 page booklet that we've created with all the calls they'll be learning organized by lesson. And that is available along with the flashcards and some other stuff on the, what's it called? I'm blanking. The There's Caller a, Lab Knowledge. Caller Lab Knowledge Base, yeah, Agent. thanks. You're a good man, Dan. Bruce, what's the MCASD for? What's that mean? Uh, that's, I shouldn't have put that in there. That's, there's a local umbrella organization for all the clubs in our area. And that's called Metropolitan Council of Square Dancers or something. Metropolitan Chicago Association of Square Dancers. Um, so we were, I kind of skipped over that, didn't I? The fact that we had two classes going and they're both at the same place, meant that we could have a dance. So every month or two, we'd have a dance for all the students at their level. So they could get in a more, let's just go and have fun kind of mode. All right, this is what the, the booklet for the students looks like. And that comes with the class. Our first year of dances, I started trying to put a, a dance schedule together for the club for the next season. Found a room for $45 a night that would hold six squares, a little tight, but we could do it. Called the callers I liked, offered the bonus, offered the house minus the $45 for the rental. And I was kind of nervous about people accepting because we didn't really have a club at that point. Uh, I needed them to take a chance on us. The team thought my venue choice was crazy. What if we had big crowds? But I knew better, we wouldn't. They said, we will. So I said, okay. And I went out and got a new place that has three times the space for the same price. And attendance got up pretty consistently to about nine squares. So I don't know how that happened, but it did. We need more callers. This is, this is my main message today. God, we need more callers. Um, we need beginner callers. We need anyone who's willing to call to risk it and take a class and learn as they go. Because you will learn as you go. If you do your homework, you've got to put in the work. But if, you're, if you come prepared, that's the key word. If you come prepared to every class and you've got your stuff set up in square view or something, um, you can get through a class in good shape. If what you're going to do is write things down on a, a yellow legal pad and it's sitting on the desk and you're reading that, that's not going to work because you can't keep track of the dancers as you read off a screen. But if you're just beginning, work everything out in advance, have it big letters on the screen, spaced out so that you won't get confused about where you are, you'll be able to just peek down in there wherever you need it, and you, it'll get you through your first year. After your first year, you won't need it so much, but it'll still be there to guide you through your lessons. Um, so as I said before, we now have four callers teaching for the club, people that I taught that, be, that just began, you know, two or three years ago, but they're doing it now. Um, In the first year, we formed the club. By the, by the second year of, of classes, we were offering four classes a year plus a plus class. Um, Dave was doing his drill sessions on Saturdays. That's the guy who wanted to become a caller first. And it was his idea to offer a blast four consecutive Saturdays once a year. We also offer a summer class 
And uh, we don't kick the summer off. We have a summer dance series each Tuesday night, and it looks, at least the poster looks like that. So every Tuesday, they got a chance to dance. There is a flaw in what we're doing, and I don't know how to fix it, especially because of where we are. We're in a, in a region that is totally devoted to plus. And ourselves and Glenview are the only two clubs that we're offering Club 50. So we couldn't just do Club 50. Um, but ideally, Club 50 should be a destination. What happens when you're doing Club 50 and Plus is that new people come to the dance, they see people doing Plus, and they figure they've got to do that too. They want to learn to load the vote. And suddenly you've got people feeling compelled to move on. I think it would be maybe even better if you could just make Club 50 what it was all about and not have people feeling they had to rush on to plus. Um, I'm not sure everyone should dance plus. Anyways, moving on. Uh, not everyone should square dance. Rocky Mountain is one of the people that we learned from and they have a very high retention rate. And I knew that we weren't that good. We were, you know, near what they were retaining. And I asked the guy about it. And they, he said, we screen really hard at the beginning. We try and only get the people in the class that are going to succeed. And we don't encourage everyone to go on. I think that's wise. I kind of try and do that too. Um, I, I talk about how we all have our different abilities. I'm very bad at remembering names. And I just admit to that. And that's just the way my brain works. And if, if, if this wasn't fun for you and you couldn't get it, find something else. This isn't for everybody. And if you can keep the people who just don't have a clue from joining your classes, they'll go better. So when you've got somebody who really isn't getting it, the whole square just doesn't have a chance for that little period of time they won't get what the class is about because he'll be just standing in the middle lost and you just can't afford that. So this is the hard part about square dancing, dealing with the people who cannot get it. This is just an idea that I think is really cool. We haven't done it yet. It just always seems hard to do, but I'd like to see a class that meets twice a week. Rocky Mountain does this. They're a group in the Midwestern, the Western states, Colorado, I think. Um, it would mean you could finish twice as fast and you'd have that, you'd have less chance for people to forget things between classes, which, which does happen. Uh, if the class is finished in nine weeks, you could even offer classes September, November, January, and March. You can double your number, number of classes if you've got enough teachers. And we have a lot of teachers now, so we can just keep growing the class, growing the, the club, because we have extra teachers. You got one teacher, you're gonna have to work your butt off. I had to do that the first couple of years, but after that, I had help. Anyhow. Um, there's all sorts of material. Jim Langdon's Rocky Mountain Recruiting Plan is on the uh, same database as my stuff is. I think that's worth looking at. Um, if you go on the Colorado Lab database, we're going to give you a link for this, but search for North Shore Squares and you'll find all the stuff that we've put up there. Uh, and of course, I'm hoping you'll get all excited about becoming a Square Dance Scholar, the book. Um, so here's my summation. Avoid the negative image of square dancing. Know that it's there. Try and avoid the outfits. But other than that, you just got to do it. You just put in the hours. Um, the first year I was only 10, teaching twice a week. That's not hard. The second year was three times a week. That's not hard. Be prepared when you show up for class. That's the essence of everything. I think square dancing is a wonderful product. 
and you just have to sell it right and it'll it'll sell looking back upon north shore squares it was a huge amount of fun and it was hard work yeah but it was fun work i had a blast doing it i really recommend you, you just take the plunge and go for it i have never found um a community civic center that didn't want to support something like this. So you just got to find a park district or something like that, go in there and say, I'm a square dance teacher and have something ready for them to show them what you want to do. And it'll happen. And that's the end of the talk. And I'm going to get a drink of water while you guys figure out what to do. Thank you very much. Um... It's most of the presentations we do here, um, I'm kind of back and a little bit disengaged. And uh, you held me all the way through because these are all things that I am discovering as or was discovering until COVID of with my uh, group and you're about a year ahead of me, a year or two ahead of me on that. Um, got a question from Phil Pierce as to whether or not you're going to make the slides available, which I would love. I sure I could. Okay. Um, Janet Lewis sent it. Uh, I think she meant to send it to the group, but hit me up with it. She asks, uh, in addition to the dues, which covered seven dances, do they pay for set dances past that seven or do you, they only have seven a year. What's the structure of the dues? First year, we only had seven lined up. First year, when I was making it all up, we didn't even have a club. I mean, I was just going out on a limb there and I'm gonna, we're gonna form a club, I'm gonna do this. But I had to try and line people up in advance because if you wait too long, you won't get anybody. Right. So I only did seven the first year. Just to clarify, uh, you're seven after that, it was once a month. Yes. Say that again, Will. The seven dances you talk about, those are events separate from the classes, correct? Oh, yeah. And, and eventually, after the first year, we were doing nine a month. Once a month is what we did. Um, by the way, I think that background you're using, Mel, is fantastic. <laughs> um, so um, how much are you charging for the lessons? I charge a lot. Um, What's the... um, I, this is a matter of principle almost with me. When I was at Glenview, I, I was paid very little for teaching. And it just bothers me that somehow we've got this mentality in square dancing that the caller shouldn't make much money. And I charged like $11 a class, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I never saw any problem with that. And and this, I, I'd get a bonus at the end of the year that was ridiculously large. And I thought I'd been charging them a lot and then they'd give me hundreds of dollars extra. So <laughs> I think we should charge what we need to charge and uh, feel we're worth it. Okay. So yeah. when you set your group up and actually became a club, was there like paperwork that you filled out, joined your state organization? How did all that work? Eventually you do stuff like that. Um, I didn't worry about it in the beginning. In the beginning it was just me. I had to, I, I was a legitimate caller with Caller Lab and I had the insurance as a result. So I had the things that they will need with the park district say, they'll need to know that you're insured. And that's about all they really need to have from you. So the stuff that came later, once we decided to form a club, happened over the next year. We, you know, we got incorporated and we did all that stuff and we joined the various groups that we thought we should join. But Well, what about dancer insurance? Cause you said you were covered through Collar Lab, which I understand, but what about the dancers? Well, once we formed a club, I was, I was covered for the classes by my own insurance and by the fact that the park district had insurance. You know, any park district you teach through is going to have insurance. 
um, once we joined, once we'd had created a club and joined the local umbrella organization, the club then had insurance by doing that, by joining the umbrella. Make sense? And uh, so I want to have a, hear a little bit more about your experience with the park district, but I know that we didn't bother getting a business license until we got together with the park district in our area and they said, oh, you got to have a business license. Well, for that, we just read it straight from the hall and the hall didn't care. I, you know, you'll, you'll hit these bumps when you hit them and you just, you know, you fill out a form and you hand it in and you're done. I mean, it, it's not a big worry. It's not something to be intimidated about. So uh, Mark Hart asks about blast class format and they go all day Saturdays for four consecutive Saturdays. Um, I worry about blasts. Dave wanted to do it, so I said, <laughs> go for it, man. But I think that's it's a hard way to learn. It's a rough day, you know, it's 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 eight hours of dancing in one day. Good God. But um he likes it so. I've I've done a just to see the teaching style. I've done a, a mainstream in two weekends, um, last class, two days. And the only people who were successful with it were people who were coming back or people who had a lot of other dance experience, swing dancers specifically. So I, people I know a club there. down south of us that does, does all its teaching through blasts. And once or twice now, one of their members, one of the people who run the club has admitted to me you know, the blasts don't really work very well, but they keep doing them. So mm -hmm. I don't know what else to tell you. If, if you go back and listen to our session by Barry Johnson on how the brain works in learning, it says you need a break and then come back and a break and then come back. Um, and a blast class may not fully provide that. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just curious what a blast was. I didn't, I, the term didn't ring any bells oh. with me. Okay. It just means get them all together for a for a whole day. Come back the next week, four consecutive Saturdays in a row. They're done. It's that, the fire. Not only, that not only would be hard for the dancers, that'd be hard on the caller too. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There are uh, people who run uh, uh, blast uh, classes where they have them come in Friday night and then they leave Sunday morning, uh, and um, and they do uh, all of uh, you know basic and mainstream in that amount of time. Yeah, um, I've seen I, that. I think that's uh, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, Helen asks uh, about a little bit more information on the flashcards, how you use them. Um, what the they're just flashcards and they've got the name of the call on the front and on the back they've got a definition of the call. So you can, you can use it either way. You can look at the definition and say what the name of the call is or you can look at the name of the call and, and say what definition of it would be. And so these are just the, the dancers use them on their own? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'd like to add something that you didn't quite clarify there, Bruce. Your flashcards, your handbook to the dancers, everything else goes beyond what most callers that even call for a full year would do. They give the dancers information, the names of formation, the definitions with a diagram. It explains to the dancers and it engages the dancers in a user-friendly format that they actually like. And uh, from a few that I've spoken to, they said what they like to do is actually say, oh, this is what's coming up next week. They read ahead and they get prepared because they are that well engaged. Uh, those flashcards are for the callers, but they're also, or sorry, those flashcards are for the dancers, but they're also for the callers to engage with the dancers with. And I think it's a brilliant and a genius idea the way you've got it laid out. When we did the booklet the first time, we handed it out each week and people would ask us, can we have one for next week? And it dawned on us, this is a good thing. You know, don't get in the way of this. So now we just give them the whole book right at the beginning and let them, let them look wherever they want. If they want to get to next week's early, that's super with us. Yeah, and what's what's really nice about it as far as the engagement goes, 
as opposed to what many callers have been doing over the last years is just giving them a list of the printed out definitions, which is really quite confusing when you start looking at it. The, the way you've got yours laid out for the 14 weeks is very clear. It's succinct. It tells you what it is. It goes through the formations, or sorry, through the basics of what's a partner, what's a corner, et cetera. And then at the end, you actually have formations that make reference to the calls. It doesn't inundate you with a whole bunch of technical jargon. It's a you know, really good layout and it's a good pictorial layout. I'll bet you've heard this before, but the definitions that Color Lab puts out are for callers. They're, they're, they're like, you know, you don't go and ask your client if you're a lawyer to go read the, the law books. That's what you've learned how to do. You've got to explain it to them so that they can understand it. And that's what callers should be doing. I just want to also mention that <clears throat> some patterns for this Club 50 idea or the SSD uh, say it can be done in 12 weeks, in which case you could have three times a year. And I, I think we do 18 weeks to get them through Club 50. And I think the extra weeks really help us get them so that they can actually dance when they go out and do it instead of be the guy that's crashing the square. So I would, I would encourage people to not rush the teaching process. Don't make it as fast as you can possibly do it. Give yourself time at the end. We're done with the teaching by about 12 or 13 weeks, but then we got five weeks to get them used to dancing and getting the speed up a little bit and getting them so that they're real dancers. And don't just throw them to the wolves right off the bat. Um, go for it. Finish your thought, Bruce. Oh, I'm done. I, I, I oh. said that I needed. I, I, I want to jump in here because we've reached our nominal one hour and do our usual um, thank yous of Dan for engineering, organizing, getting Bruce to talk to us, thanking Bruce an awful lot for, for a great presentation. Thanking, that's, I agree, um, Daryl. Thanking all of you for coming and hanging in. Um, and as usual, well, diff other than, <laughs> different than usual, Bruce's presentation part went much longer than normal, but there was, it would have been foolish to cut him off because he kept coming up with good stuff. And as usual, we run over the hour after the formal thing. At this point, I just say, you know, if you have to leave or are saturated, feel free to go and don't feel guilty about it. But I'm sure Bruce and Dan um, are willing to hang around and, and answer more questions um, and listen to more comments. And so with that, um, let's continue and carry on if, because I have a few comments I want to throw in eventually too. But Bruce, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah. I'm looking forward to receiving the book and reading it. Okay. You're a good man. <laughs> I do have a question. Uh, how uh, we've got 50 movements in this social dance program, right? How, in depth, how I'm, I'm wondering about the amount of variety that, uh, that you can find it to rather than saying it's wide open. You can do everything that you want and trying to prepare the dancers for that. Do you understand what I'm asking? I, I had a, I have a glimmer. I might be able to answer the question or I might answer the wrong question. <laughs> okay. I would say that you're asking, can you, can you keep it interesting with just 50 calls? Is that what you're saying? Not really. I know that okay. you can keep it interesting, but uh, this is a social dance program rather than uh, what we would normally think of as a 50 basic uh, go whole hog. Uh, what's happened in the activity since I began dancing is we've gone from more from rote dancing to this in-depth mental challenge. Uh, you present the idea of the puzzle dancing. Uh, with, with your group there, without the idea of going on to the plus in your area, do you limit the amount of uh, variety to keep that easy for people to enter into uh, the regular group 
and not expect to be learning continuously? For, by variety, do you mean standard positions or getting weird with the calls? Standard positions. Do you, lim uh, do you limit it to any no. kind of standard positions at all? Uh, so yeah, you I, could turn it inside out and blow the... I, blow the I like all position dancing. I, I believe understand that, that it teaches them better the call. The okay. more different ways they know how to do a call, the better they're going to know it. That's why you uh, are very free about saying you're not going to be able to make it. You might as well go do something else. No, I don't say that to anybody unless they're just not getting anything. But some people don't. You just be. I, I've been amazed sometimes at how yeah. little some people are able to learn. Uh, in yeah. my club, I, we get kind of a, a the the dancers will come up to me and say, "So and so is a, a very nice person, but." keep the speed up and they'll make their own decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no problem with that. Uh, and I'm not saying that you're doing anything wrong, Bruce. I think you're doing uh, everything absolutely perfect. If you're growing, it's working for you. And that's a great thing. Uh, I just wonder how we're going to accommodate the callers that we have in the activity now that their brain is already saying, okay, I'm, I'm, and hey, even the ones that are curious, John earlier said, okay, how about if I pass through and then lead right? Okay, kids pass through and lead right. Good question, especially for the mentality of the callers that we have in the activity today um, and the activity as we have it today. Uh, we're into this more about how many different ways can I do this? And it's not the dancers, it is the callers. So how about that? You know what I would say to that? If you do that to a, to a group, I think they're gonna learn something. It's, it's gonna be, they're gonna freeze for a second and then you're gonna say to them, just do what you've been taught. And if they do that, then you get a problem on your hands. What are you gonna do with them next? I don't know the answer to that one. But I know that in having to, to take a call like lead right and do it from an unusual position, I think that cements their understanding of lead right. Oh, it means do this and do that, even if it's not, even if it doesn't make sense to me in the normal way. If I just do that call the way I was taught it, maybe he'll be able to get us out of it and trust the calls and trust the caller. I, I, I have no problem with doing something like that as long as I figured out what the heck I'm gonna do next. Right at this moment, I can't think of a whole lot to do with that situation. I don't think but, it's, I think it's bogus if you heads pass through lead right. I, if somebody called that to me, I just, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, at the levels that I've danced at, it's allowed to do stuff like that and they get away with it because they can, they can, they have ways to move people around that will resolve it. If well, you I've did been that calling... in a basic class, I don't think you'd have a, a good way to go. I'm not recommending you do that, but I don't think you're going to hurt the students. Well, that my uh, I've been calling C3B since the mid '80s, and in my technical opinion, that's a bogus choreography. It's not legal. All right. I've never used it, but I didn't want to put the say that it wasn't acceptable to try it. Hey, in my defense, I was just trying to think of some ideas. I mean, new calls were developed. Don Beck made new calls. That doesn't mean there's no new calls out there to be made. So I just thought I'd ask it. I agree. I, I think trying to be innovative is great. So um, could you maybe go back over and talk a little bit more about um, flyer design? I don't have the perfect answer on this one. I do know that finding a good picture is really hard. I went to great lengths to of taking pictures and getting people to show up without the cowboy outfits to try and get a picture that I liked. And I showed one on that, um, that page that I showed. I hope everyone saw it. And, you know, try and find pretty people. I hate to say it, but try and find people who are young and pretty and great smiles. And then you got to go through the process of getting a good picture of them, which is hard to do. Um, so you need a good picture. That's the most important thing you'll do. 
I, I think you have to somehow address the issue of people's preconceptions. I think a lot of people have a very negative view of us and it's not true and it's not right, but if they do, and I try and somehow deal with that. And I think that asking for what you want is legitimate. I mean, hey, I Bruce, say, Bruce, on your preconception thing, I think uh, one of the things that has ruined a lot of square dancers, I don't know if it's as much anymore, but when they danced in school, they danced the records in gym class and they were forced to go in. It seems like uh, that was a constant, oh, I remember that from gym class. I'm not. Yes. Does that, I how, that how, are you, how do you counteract that? Well, I said right at, the, right at the top of that flyer I showed you. Well, I didn't actually show you the final flyer. I should have done that. But it said, today is square dancing. It's not what you think it is. Right at the start. And I thought that might catch their interest. First thing you do is you got to catch their interest because if they don't stand there and look at the flyer for more than a second, you've got nothing. So you try and catch their interest. And you then try and present your arguments. And I, I've heard people talk a lot about how important white spaces on a flyer. And I think getting the message across is even more important. So I don't always have what a good advertising agent would think is the perfect flyer. Um, and I go ahead and try and address the issues of, well, the first one you got to address is that it's not going to be funny looking clothes that they're expected to wear. The second issue is the music. It's not only going to be some Lugan brothers, uh, which I happen to like, but I don't use in my score dance calling. And you've got to address the issue of this is somehow something guys should consider. And I tried to do that by saying, um, Football. The football analogy. And that um, for the girls, you've got to say, don't worry about having a partner because a lot of them won't have partners. I once, for what it's worth, I once had a woman walk into the class, the intro party, look around at all the outsized, the, the more women than men, turn around and walk out saying to, the, to all of us, I came here looking for a man. And that was the end of that. So, um, there are, there are things that'll hold people back from even trying it. If you can get them in the room and you can do a good job with the intro party, you will have a class. But you've got to get them in the room and you've got to somehow deal with those issues. And I think somewhere, even if it's in bullet points, you've got to tell people that things are going to be okay, that it's going to be worth trying. I want to interject a couple of things here. Um, Bruce, one of the things that I, I strongly agree with some of the stuff you've said is is in slightly different words square dancing has a bad reputation um and you've got to overcome that to get new people in a lot of clubs like to do um demos i'm not big on that but the times i've been asked to call them i've insisted on quite a few things one is that they don't wear square dance outfits well to me one of the biggest barriers of getting somebody that might be interested is getting them to relate that they could be doing what they're seeing. And if they have to, they, they can't necessarily relate to getting dressed up by, like cowboys and cowgirls. And so if you get street clothes, that makes it, cuts down one barrier. And two is people say, well, call, easy stuff so that the dancers will do a good job. And for me, to somebody who's not a square dancer, really the Ducey's no harder than a right and left throw um, because they don't know either of them. So you don't have to call easy stuff. And I tell the dancers, you may make a mistake, big deal. That's what we do. We have fun, we make a mistake, we recover. And I think this shows the people watching that you don't have to be perfect that it's not a performance team, that it's people out there having fun. Um, so yeah, the barriers to break down are, are 
are some of those things. And I think the costumes are a big one. Um, I do want to throw in a quick experience I had, um, John, when you were talking about the poor introduction in school. Um, granted, I did have some dancing in the front lawn of the school with records in second or third grade, but the thing I remember most was in junior high school, um, we had a large gym that was had these big sliding doors that separated the boys gym from the girls gym. And there was a small crack between the two. And our teachers told us that, you know, if we catch you guys peeking through the crack watching the girls, we're going to open the doors and make you square dance with them. Uh, this was, this was our introduction. Square dancing was a punishment. Um, yeah, we love that rep. <laughs> Somehow I got over that through other things later, but um, anyway. So Helen has had her hand up. Helen, jump in here. Okay, um, um, I'm from Sweden and uh, we do things a little bit different here and I'm a member of two clubs. One club is the new club and we've gone from zero to 80, I think in a couple of years. And we've experienced many of the things that you have talked about. <coughs> And one of the things that we have in this, in the country here, where I have my country house, is that people haven't really seen square dance. There hasn't been any square dancing around. So they haven't really known what it looks like. Um, and we have, we've also had uh, sort of new classes with not very many angels, so that they know, they, they don't really know what to expect for So I, I agree with you there. Uh, then we have the other club, which is in Stockholm, the, the, the um, capital just outside Stockholm there uh, we're a very small club and we do I think you call it demonstrations I was going to call it promotionals but you didn't mention that that was any tactic that you had that you sort of danced where people could see you um, that's something we use sometimes but it, as I agree it doesn't always give the right uh, picture because it's the elderly people who come and dance and some of them really like their dresses so they wear dress up and so sometimes that could be not such a good thing. Um, and then the second thing I'd like to talk about is in Sweden, we teach basic in two terms. So by Christmas, you've only learned basic one. Uh, and this is the standard. The next term, you'll learn mainstream and maybe turn four. But after two years, you might have done the whole plus. So we you know, spend a lot of time learning. And we expect the dancers to be able to dance not only from standard positions, but um, half sachet and all the rest of it when we do things from uh, different positions and we're expected to know that. And we don't like graduating people. We graduate people after basic, after the one year. And we don't really like them to graduate until they can dance both left side, right side, and are quite good at it. And, um, we keep about 40, 50% of our dancers, just like you mentioned that you expect to keep about that amount of dancers, but uh, we, we go very much slower. Uh, I just like, I want to point that out because I find absolutely incredible that you can teach anyone all the way up to plus in one year. Um, and also just the last thing I can mention, I'm a, I, I'm a very new caller and in my club where we're the new club, I've had three basic, uh, courses or groups uh, last year and trying to try to teach the basic, but we had a lot of fun and um, they're all with us and they all want to come back desperately when the pandemic is over. So I think it's okay. That's just, I just what want I'm to say that anytime somebody tells me they're taking their time about teaching, I'm, I'm all for that. I think that the worst thing you can do is try and rush it, which is what I think happens a lot. And when I hear somebody's going to be slow about it, I'm saying that's, that's great. But we do discuss the fact that some people, you know, the one, the, the good ones, the all stars, one year can be kind of a long time, especially since they can maybe can't go dancing for the first year. Uh, at mm -hmm. Christmas, we something have, we sometimes have basic thirty dances so that the new dancers will be able to. We have one tip of basic thirty, then we'll have a plus, or so we'll have a mainstream or something, and then we'll have the basic thirty, and so that they can come out to dance because otherwise you can't go dancing for the first year, and this we find a bit of a problem. Yeah, that is, that I'm, I agree. That seems like a little bit of a problem. For for the very for the all stars, it will be a long year. 
but I have a feeling they won't give up on it just because it's taking time. You know, if you give them the chance to help out in some ways or to feel like they're getting it and I don't know, I, I, I would worry about that a little bit, but I'd rather see you taking your time than, than rushing people through it. The other thing about I think the key in what you said there, Helen, is regardless of how long it takes, at your new group, your, your new dancer group, your two dancer groups, your all-stars, they're all having fun and they want to come back. That's the key, right? They're all having fun and they want to come back. You're giving them a venue, you're giving them what they want, and that's to come out and have some fun, be entertained, go home with a good feeling. That's what it's about, and it doesn't matter. And, and this is what I was saying with Bruce. One of the things with, with yours that I really laud is you're doing a Club 50 or an SSD presentation, but the biggest bonus that you have is you're giving them nine venues a year to go and dance to. If you go to parts of the States, they run a basic, a mainstream. They have maybe one dance a year that mainstream dancers can go to, nothing for basics. It's all plus with mainstream tips. Half They've got no venue to go. Yours has that. Helen, yours has that. You have a venue for your dancers to go and you provide a venue for them to go. You may only do five or six a month, uh, five or six a year, but that's five or six a year more than most basic and mainstream dancers get in a lot of places these days. I just want to mention something about uh, doing demos. Um, I would agree that doing demos in the cowboy outfits you might help a little bit, you can also hurt because that's the image that you're reinforcing. We don't want to do that. Both, both at Glenview and at North Shore Squares, the tendency is to say yes to doing a demo. We also know that we don't really know if we can point to anybody who actually joined as a result. But you then have to tell yourself that every time you don't always get the, the sale on the first initial impression somebody has of something. So every time you do a demo or something like that, you may not see results, but maybe somebody saw it and got it in their head a little bit. Maybe it helps in some ways that you're not aware of. So sure, why not do a demo? In the but new the club, in the, in the new club uh, that I, I'm, I'm with, we do a lot of demos and I did one yesterday uh, out, outdoors and um, we danced basic one or they danced basic one for an hour. and. They hadn't danced for six months and um, we made some mistakes, but uh, we all laughed and we had a good time. And I think just the fact that people in that little town saw us dancing square dance reminds them that there, this is something that, that they could start with when the pandemic is over, because we haven't started dancing here in Sweden yet. Oh, we haven't either. Um, I want to go back to your, uh, uh, the, the dues, the parks, and uh, dance admission. From what I understand, your dues covered the admission for your club for all of the dances that you held that year. But what about outside people coming in? What did you charge them? That's the first question. The second question is, is you were dancing at the park system. Around here, um, the parks will not allow you to charge any admission fee for activities that happen in the parks. So if I did a fee like you guys did with the $90 structure at the beginning, what would you do with outside dancers coming to your dance and you can't charge them according to the facility usage policy? Yeah, that's a real bummer. Um, we've got a lovely hall in Evanston that is labeled the same way and we can't use it because we need to charge. We can use it for an intro party. We've done that, but we can't hold our dances there because we have to charge for the dances. Um, the people who are not members of the club have to pay nine bucks a dance, which is frankly a very reasonable amount. That's per person, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'd note that we, when we started out, we kind of were feeling around for what we did and didn't on, uh, think was a reasonable amount of money and the logistics of taking money. We put a big jar by the door and either a suggested donation or just a pay what you think it's worth. And I think that we have always ended up with more money in that jar than the number of dancers times the suggested donation. Cool. But would that, that at the facility where you can't charge admission is a donation 
I guess I'd have to ask them if a donation is different than an admission charge. Yeah, as, our district. But yeah, we we even now when we we have a stated admission price, we don't we just leave the jar there. We don't police that in any way. Jolanda, what were you going to say? Um, I was wanting to comment on the the demos. So. Um, in my situation, what we've done is we've, um, because of, of uh, dance clothes and stuff, we will have at least one square in the, the traditional, traditional style. And then however many extra squares we've got for that day, we'll have street clothes. And then sometimes we'll have street clothes where the partners are, um, you know, the same color. And then some with uh, squares where it's all mixed. And then um, we'll invite people later on to, uh, to try it, you know, just with circle left and circle right and stuff like that. And quite often the comments that we have received and I have personally received them is we, we came because we were attracted to the traditional outfits and we were curious about it, but then having the street clothes there made it easier to actually go on and try it. Like, within the demo, right? So having a combination of the two seemed to work. Just the thought. I have heard people say that they thought the outfits were cute. And uh, everyone's welcome to their opinion. I just know that I've heard this so many times that the uh, there are people who think that that's the uniform of square dancing, the Western outfits, and that they don't want to have to wear it. And I'd rather not have that in the way. A few thoughts on paying. Uh, people generally have the mentality of you get what you pay for. And um, if you don't, in fact, I kind of disagree with you, Bruce, on having, like most groups do, the free night, party night first, just to attract people in. Um, I, again, you get what you pay for. What I've tried to, in the past, and, and I've got to admit, I haven't been successful. I'm not an organizer. But one of the things I've heard that I liked was people have printed out things like business cards, things that say, this is a, a ticket to, to come to this thing. It's a, you know, it's a $10 value, but I'm giving it to you for nothing because you're a friend. And I've done that too. <laughs> it's, it's a reminder. They think they're paying for something. Um, the other thing is if you, as you do charge for a series, people are less likely to drop out in the middle um, because they've already paid for um, sessions that are coming up. Um, but on the, uh, when you do what they do is paying one at a time, there the caller has to remember that you've got to work harder. You've got to not only teach a lesson, but you've got to call a dance. You've got to entertain them every night so that when they leave that night, they're anxious to come back next week. They're not just worn out from learning, learning, learning. And relative to what Helen was saying about just teaching basics one for, for many, many weeks, we all have, as callers, in order to make that work, have to improve our calling skills so that we can, and I'm not talking choreographic skills, I'm talking entertainment skills, so that we're basically entertaining these people week after week after week. And we just happen to slip in a new term every once in a while in the teaching, but, but we're there to entertain them. And they're coming to entertain us because we love calling. So it's a, it's a win-win situation, but there's a lot of, of, and as you say, Bruce, a lot of, we need new callers and, and when we do introduce new callers or get people involved in the activity. Um, and if you teach, especially younger people to dance, there's a certain percentage that just can't wait to get behind the mic and do that also. Um, I, I fell into it with a, a totally different thing. Um, I thought you had to be born that way and somehow I got roped into it one time and of course, the, you know, one time, and when I said jump, people jumped, it was, it went to my head and I went from there. But uh, um, entertainment is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make people happy, whether they, whether it's a memory game as well or not. Um, you can teach more quickly. 
you know, I, for many years, taught two classes a year at Tech Squares at MIT, where we taught zero to plus in 13 weeks and had successful dancers. If you use proper teaching techniques, you can do it with the proper people. Um, I taught plus one night, no, mainstream. Um, the woman I was dating that I've now been married to for 35 years uh, said, well, if we're going to that New England convention thing, I guess I ought to learn how to dance. She was a contra dancer, so knew maybe basic 10 calls. And so I got a square together of dancers and I only get, managed to get six people so added her and my daughter, and they learned plus one. I mean, they learned mainstream one night. We, you know, I was able to teach them, and, and they were able to dance mainstream. It's possible if you teach correctly, but it's not recommended at all. My, my wife, within six months, had finished C1 and was starting C2, not with a one basement group, but with another group. And total saturation. She hasn't danced since. So it's definitely not recommended, even though she was a good dancer. Um, entertainment is the main thing you want to do. Keep them happy. Keep them entertained. Hey, Don, I just came back into the discussion, but I, I, I got to go somewhere. But if you, if you guys are uh, thinking about getting away from the Western image, why don't you just call it modern square dancing instead of modern Western square dancing? Um, I mean, if we're trying to if we're trying to shed the image of of you know cowboy shirts and and crenolins and the big dresses, why don't we just why don't we just try to evolve it over to a modern square dancing? Just like to go into the social square dancing, to get rid of the Western aspect. I the, the, word don't square, Sorry, the, word, the word square is still in there, but that's a good step in the right direction. I mean, some I, of us would be happy if we just called it puzzle dancing uh, and left square and western out of it yeah i see western <laughs> on bruce's uh, flyers and we huh? don't put western on ours well my article it still says modern western square dancing i mean why don't we just why don't we just fade out the western part of this i would agree do it yeah. well, the only reason here's, though. here's here's a question for you john just and in answer to this if we look at Country music, what do you think? Most people don't, if you talk country music today and it's a very, very popular medium, most people are not thinking Minnie Pearl and Johnny Cash and, and et cetera, et cetera. That's old country. Most country music today is big, big, big presentation shows. M most Western, country and Western is big presentation shows. That music, that presentation of self has evolved across the image. When you look at some of the country stars today, it's not cowboy boots and everything. That's part of the show, but that's not what the show is. Square well, dancing that's... has left that behind, unfortunately. We've decided well, not to progress. And as Bruce said, Bruce, I was just looking at your, um, your website. Um, Dan, if you don't mind, can I just share my screen for a second? I just want to point something out. I well, believe it, you're it, completely it, uh, in response. In response to you, uh, Mel, I, when you say uh, country and Western, I still think of the old country and Western. So yep, I, I, haven't progressed, I haven't progressed out of that. So just ask, like modern Western. Ask somebody under 25 who their favorite country and Western singer is and what they think of the show. It's not what you think anymore. As, as well, I know. I, I, I was just, think, you, is, just a suggestion, guys. I think one of the realities is that when people were in grade school learning, the guys who were teaching it were using these very old records that yeah. really were old time country music. And that's the way they think of square dancing because they experienced it once and that's what it was like. And, and I just avoid country in, the, in an intro party. I wouldn't use it. Yeah. I use it in my regular stuff because I like country music, but I don't want that to be the image they get out of an intro party. The other Hell, I like both kinds of music, country and Western, but, uh, but I do have a serious comment, which is that I think the reason the word Western got in there, uh, and, and I don't recommend really using it in advertising, as everybody has mostly said here, you just leave it out, um, is uh, because there's uh, a thing which uh, the general public does not necessarily know, but people in other kinds of dancing may know there's a, there's a thing called Eastern square dancing, which is totally different. Um, 
and uh, mostly I think nowadays goes by the name traditional square dancing. So I so for advertising purposes, I would just say square dancing, or if you want to jazz it up, I'd say modern square dancing. But there's no reason to put the word Western in there, really. Fair enough. There's a caller named Scott Brown who has rebranded it as modern <clears throat> modern pattern dancing. He's taken square out of it to, to really break the association. But I don't know that that's a good thing, but it is an approach. I knew and somebody I think did that, yeah. They have since actually called it American square dance now. I have, I have a question for Helen. Um, in over here, there are groups that teach square dancing. There are groups that teach Russian folk dancing. There are groups that teach Irish step dancing. Um, they, we think of, of square dancing as an American folk activity that has sort of grown slowly. I'm just curious, when you introduce square dancing, is it as a, um, an American folk thing? And is there an attraction because of that? And do you also teach other not you personally, but other types of folk dancing, and are you competing against them? And and how do we compare with that? Uh, we have our own Swedish folk dancing, which uh, which also is in decline, but which has been very popular. Uh, I think Michael from Sweden. I think he smiled when you mentioned American square dancing, because we quite often call it American square dancing, uh, but we usually just say square dancing. But but we also say American square dancing. And you think of it as an American folk dance, as, as you do other yes. country folk dances? And yes. actually, are, are other countries, do they have a modern version of other countries' folk dances like we have um, modern well, square dance? I, I tried Scottish uh, country dancing last year. We had a, we had a, a, a weekend of all different kinds of dancing in, in Stockholm, in the, in the capital, in a park there. And I watched it, and there was some Scottish... Um, dancing and I went to one of their classes but that that was very old it was the old uh, uh, dancing and there were lots of other uh, people dancing different kinds of dancing that that day and we were we were also one group uh, showing uh, our dancing but I think there were there were quite a few uh, skirts at that dance too but then there were, there were three squares one in traditional and two just I think we just happened and we did just danced because we were there. Um, but I think, Michael, don't we call it American Square Dancing, isn't that right? Uh, I will think so, yes. Yeah, I think so too. And I saw you smile when someone mentioned American Square Dancing, so uh, that, that's what we call it. The, uh, the Swedes, by the way, are, I don't, I don't know if you guys know this, if you're in the, the same communities or not, but they're they're also uh, very big over there into um, swing dancing, uh, which is uh, m the way they do it anyway, an American, you know, thing based out of New York City. Well, I haven't heard of that. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, some of the uh, some of the top uh, some of the top people in that uh, in that dance uh, community are uh, and they have a lot of groups, uh, you know, performance groups and all kinds of things that out of uh, out of Sweden. Oh, OK. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> One of the things that I've, so when we talk about modern square dancing and we try to use that term to convince people it's not what you remember from grammar school, which by the way was taught by people that had these old records as Bruce was saying, but it was also taught by people that weren't square dancers or square dance callers and thought, oh God, I've got to teach this part of the curricula. And uh, this is one I don't know much about. so. Let me just sort of push it through. But anyway, square dancing is a folk activity and it has evolved um, over the last, what, two centuries? And especially during the 60s and 70s evolved a lot. And, and Carl Lab has tried to slow the evolution down. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it does change. And, and so modern square dancing is what the folk activity has evolved to currently and who knows what it will evolve to further. I also want to throw in, Bruce, I think you mentioned the um, 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 Call Lab knowledge base. There's an awful lot of good material there. We had um, the curator of it, uh, Bruce Clasper, talk about it at one point on, on these Saturday sessions. 
I still feel it's not organized as well as I would like to have it, but if you take the time to go through it, there's a lot. And if you're looking for information on starting new stuff, I was trying to, to find a specific thing before this session to post it in the, in the chat, but I couldn't find it, which says it's totally not as organized as I'd like. But there's a lot of information on marketing, which, which helps. Um, two or three years ago, the keynote at the Caller Lab um, convention was given by Mike Hogan on marketing. And he's a marketing man, not from square dancing, but from other places. And it was an excellent talk. And I was trying to look for a recording of that and suggest people look for it. But maybe you guys can dig further. If you don't know how to find the knowledge base, look under um, knowledge.callerlab.org. Um, I tried to look under knowledgebase.callerlab.org and that didn't work, but I eventually found it. Um, but there's a lot of good marketing information. Um, some of it pertinent to Bruce's stuff, some of it going a little on the traditional side, but um, whatever works, go for it. So Don, as it happens, I am the new vice chair of the Caller Lab Knowledge Base Committee. Congratulations, Chris. Um, so yeah, right, thanks. Um, so any feedback on organization, because I also have some issues with it, but it's really the product of one person at this point. So feedback on organization, feedback on things you'd like to see included, uh, let me know and we'll work on it. Well, I, I think what I will do is not give you any feedback on organization, but whenever I have a frustration, I'm looking for something and I can't find it. Right, um, let me know, yep. And, and, and the first two things I'll point at right now, I couldn't remember how to find it. I had to find an email from, from Barry where underneath he said, click here to get to the knowledge base. Caller Labs thing doesn't have a prominent place for it. Um, I tried knowledgebase.callerlab.org, I couldn't find it, I tried callerlab.org slash knowledge base and I couldn't find it. Uh, <laughs> there, were, there were a number of uh, comments on when we had the, um, we had the caller coach, uh, when, we had, when we had the caller coaches on, uh, sort of uh, trying to defend uh, uh, the, the, uh, the caller accredited uh, coach program. And uh, so people were, you know, riding on caller live a little bit. And uh, the business of the, of the knowledge base and being able to find things like that generally on the website was uh, a hot topic. Um, so there's, a, I'll just mention it again here that there's a, definitely some some room for improvement there. Google well, the, the one Google. thing. Oh, go ahead, Alan. I was going to say Google is your friend. I put in Caller Lab and Knowledge Base, and it came right up in Google search. Yeah, My me too. But, uh, up, but it's quite difficult to find things in it. Well, as they say, a little bit of knowledge can get you in trouble. I decided to bypass Google and go right to callerlab.org and it got me into trouble. Okay. Um, if you go to callerlab.org, one of the first things you should see is a link to the knowledge base for those that want to find that and it's not readily available. It, it didn't, yeah, it didn't jump out at me when I looked. Chris, the other thing if you can find is locate um, Mike Hogan's keynote that was a few years ago. I, I assume you were there and, and remember it. I just did a, I'm not a marketing kind of person. I'm, I'm not an organizational person, but I was very impressed by his and wouldn't mind listening to it again, but just a quick look to, to let people here know about it, like for 10 minutes before this, before I joined into this session, um, I couldn't find it. Um, just, just a thought. <laughs> Boy, did that break up the conversation. Come on, I guys. Just, I just Googled it and got a direct link to it, Don. I'll send it to you. Put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'd just like to, in, in the dead, you talked about marketing and presentation, Bruce. I was just having a look at, at your website. This is why I wanted to ask about sharing the screen, if you don't mind. So I'm just going to do that. But as you can see, that's just a picture that's on the website. And it's a bunch of people. They're not in traditional square dance outfit, just a bunch of people. Most of the ones in that picture are older. They're having a good time. But then you look at as you go down through it, 
This is the presentation that you're giving when you're out in the community having fun. This is the presentation when you're out in the community having fun. They're casual, but they are in actually, if you, if you look, this is what caught my eye. And I look in your shop, you've got jackets, you've got t-shirts, you've got polo shirts. It's actually very, re I'm not uh, promoting your, your, your logos and everything else. But I noticed that everywhere I look and in the crowd and a few other places, you've got people wearing your club colors. You've got people wearing the club logo, the North Shore Squares logo, but it's very passive. It's not in your face as a Kremlin would be. You could see those people in a crowd anywhere and look for that after a presentation and say, right, I want to go and talk to that person if I'm interested. You're still in the promotion, but you're not so in your face that, oh, you'd never catch me dead wearing a Kremlin type attitude that you got. And I, I just wanted to point that out. You see a lot of people having fun wearing what is what most people wear, even though it's still a presentation of the club or the group that you're promoting. People really tend to underuse the uh, the dancers when they when they do these demos. Those are those guys are supposed to be your ambassadors, and they should be well briefed and well armed at at how to interact with uh, the the people who are you know hanging around uh, watching the demo. We always put um, we always it's never controlled who shows up, so always there's several people left over when we form squares. And those people take, you know, business cards and go around. Anyone who seems interested, they hand them the business card and uh, answer any questions they have. Janet, you were the one that originally suggested this topic. Um, at, when I frequently solicit suggestions for topics for our Saturday morning discussions, um, I know you were interested in some of the more technical, like insurance and what have you. You've got some of those questions in it. You've got any others that you want to add? No, I just, um, the, the club that's 40 minutes from me has folded as of this week. So I'm kind of picking up the pieces, starting a new club. We got a name. I've got three couples that I know for sure are from that disband club that are going to support me with the new um, new thing and so it's just a matter of going through and like I, I checked with our state uh, dancer insurance and we have to have eight paying people in order to fill out the form to get the insurance my husband and I cannot be a part of that because we're lifetime members so we would not be paying and then that insurance, that dancer insurance, I've found out is null and void if you dance in a private residence, which we are dancing in my home. So I'm, it's kind of like a catch-22. As long as we dance in my house, we have no insurance through the state organization or anything. So that's why I ask about the insurance. And then with the parks, we can't charge admission. And so it's, it's, there's just so much to it. I want to make, just make sure it's legal and above board with everything we do, um, which is why they have disbanded because they had uh, paperwork issues, they had financial issues, they had major issues. So I was not gonna take over that club. I would, well, the, the, uh, the, the people are not gonna, uh, dancing in your house are not gonna sue your quote unquote club even if it exists as, a, as some kind of legal entity because it has no money. The, the person they're gonna sue is they're gonna sue you and your caller live insurance, at least in the United States, you have a two million per uh, liability coverage that is just for exactly that sort of thing. Okay, so what I understand you saying is as long as we're dancing in my house, we don't really have to have uh, dancer insurance. Is that what I'm understanding right? Well, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but that's what I think. And if, and if that's uh, inadvisable, I would like to learn more about why. That's, that's my take on it as well. The other thing is that if you are concerned about this, um, it might also be worth talking to your insurance agent because the other place that insurance agents are happy to tack on 10 or 20 bucks worth of extra charges is onto your homeowner's insurance. And if you need specific event uh, insurance above and beyond what Caller Lab offers, they'll, my, my insurance agency has done this for me before. Um, I use USAA. But uh, yeah, I, I think 
think about what you actually need the insurance for. If you're protecting yourself from liability for things that occur, you have your homeowner's insurance and you have the caller lab insurance and those things, that seems like it's sufficient coverage for anything that I'm doing. And then as far as like finances and stuff go, if we collect money for dances and everything, um, from my understanding, that literally all just gets filed like on personal taxes because it's me technically being in business for myself. Is that a correct understanding? Sure. Yeah. The, yep. um, uh, the, 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 I, I just thought of a reason for uh, club insurance and, and again, you would want to talk probably, somebody should talk to a lawyer for all of us and just get it figured out. So we get a real answer, but uh, the, other, the other place where somebody could uh, sue, it occurs to me, and that maybe they could sue, is uh, they, they might say, well, the, the club entity uh, might not have the right corporate structure to shield its officers, um, and, in, and in general, negligence doesn't shield them anyway. And so they might, somebody could conceivably, I guess, try to say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sue the club officers in you know pierce the club corporate veil and go after them as well as uh the caller because they should have known blah blah but anyway it's a it's a good question for a for a lawyer and as opposed to like somebody like <laughs> okay if it's if it's a call a run club there's no officers though right yeah it's just you yeah okay so that that's what it will be it will be me Yeah, I think you're you're just fine with the caller lab insurance. And if you want to uh, talk to your uh, homeowner's insurance and ask about an umbrella policy for additional liability beyond the, the limits of the caller lab, then it might be worth a call. If you don't have assets that need to be protected in that scale, then probably don't need to. And then as far as obviously we're starting with ground zero in terms of funds. Um, it, literally, it's just you start charging for practices or whatever it is you start doing to gain some funds to do something with. And obviously, they're stuck with me until we have money to pay another caller to come in. And my experience is that they will be happy to hand over money in exchange for you giving them a good, good time. And they will feel guilty about the fact that you are spending money and they, they don't feel like they're contributing as much as you're contributing to your community. I was amazed at, at how often people would buy stuff for the club and, and contribute money out of the blue just because they were all excited about seeing it happen and wanted to be part of starting it. Bruce, I have a... Hundreds of dollars, you know, just showed up. Bruce, I have a couple of comments towards stuff you were talking about. And already I've forgotten one of them. Uh, way back at the beginning, you were talking about your area where a big part of the club activity, typical club activity, not yours, was stealing members from other clubs so your club wouldn't die. Um, I, and I always used to be amused when two clubs were both dying and trying to get new members, why they didn't, why they didn't combine and make a single club, why they had to wait till one died and then the club, the, the few members that were left would go over there. But one, one group that I started many decades ago and, and was successful for, for quite a while, um, the, uh, one of the things that I did and handed out the first few nights was I went through the local square dance magazine, which was the New England caller at the time. And I copied, um, I made a collage that I printed on an eight and a half, 11 sheet that showed where all the beginner classes were in the greater Boston area and handed it out just there were two reasons. One is, you know, if you find you love square dancing from how wonderfully I treated you tonight, but you can't make Tuesday night or, or Wednesday night or whatever it was, um, 
you know, go someplace else. Uh, here's plenty of opportunities for, for classes starting all over the place. Um, and for my personal thinking was, well, I can't get them in my classes, but at least they'll become dancers and I can get them to my dances sometime. Um, and the other thought, and I think this was the bigger one, was you're not alone. This is not an isolated thing. There's lots of people that do this. It's not an oddball activity. It's happening in this town, in this town, in this town, all over the Boston area. So as I say, I used to hand out a collage of, of where all the different beginner classes were. Um, not sure how much success it had, but I still think it was a good idea. Um, and maybe soon I'll think of the other thing I wanted to comment on. <laughs> and maybe not. The mutually annihilating club thing that you mentioned there is phenomenally um, ironic because doubtless uh, one of the reasons both clubs are dying is because none of the, nobody wants to be an officer. <laughs> But apparently they don't want somebody from the other club to be the officer either. Or, or they don't want to be an officer for the third time. Uh, but you know what, I, I, that always makes me wonder. People say, well, geez, these callers are trying to run their own thing and ruin the clubs. You know, but they don't want to run the club. Why don't they take advantage of a caller wanting to run a caller, la caller run club? And so all they have to do is go dance and have fun <laughs> instead of having to worry about all the organizing and, and let the caller suffer through that. He's, he's the professional. Let him do it anyway. But I can't, I that's can't remember nature. who it was, but there was a caller in New England when I went down there to do the Callers Festival. Uh, he told me that that's actually how his club got their executive motivated and the dancers motivated because they were having the same problem getting officers for the club. And he said, well, that's fine. I'll just take over the club. And suddenly there was hands coming up everywhere. <laughs> Human nature. But you're, right, you're right about promoting other clubs. I've, I've always, when I'm teaching a class and there's others, I talk to all the other callers in the area teaching class, or I used to when I was teaching. And I'd recommend, you know, go and dance with them. And when I do something, I put the same thing up, publish where all these others are, if they could. We all talked the same way as we did when I was in Europe of where we are pretty much all at the same level. And uh, one of the other callers who was promoting, he says, I'm really glad you did that. I got 13 new dancers. I got none from the promotion event, but he got 13 out of mine, which is, which is great. You know, that's fine. I have a thing. Uh, this is uh, off topic. So this is not the, the time uh, to do this uh, particular thing, but uh, on a technical note, uh, I'm not sure if the if the person was still here or not, but on the heads pass through, leave the right thing. I'd like to get together with who's ever interested uh, about that and uh, uh, talk about that a little bit about why I'm uh, so adamant about why that's a bad idea and some and some other related uh, uh, things about about that particular technical issue. But let's get back to the uh, recruiting and uh, successful program part of the uh, discussion here. Seems like we've kind of hit a natural lull in the conversation. Shall we uh, say that two hours was enough for this morning and uh, call it a, a day and carry on? Thank you once again, Bruce. Um, I'm gonna go back and hit your request again or your uh, presentation again, because there were a couple of little details that you mentioned that were like light bulbs going off in my head about things that we were, were hitting. Well, Dan, thank you for having me. And I will send you the uh, PowerPoint. Excellent. And I will post that along with the video as soon as Zoom processes it and all of the, and then YouTube processes it and all of the things happen, which will probably be sometime tomorrow. Very good. And uh, yes, everybody else is welcome to stay on, but um, I'm going to bail and stop the video and have a wonderful Saturday, y'all. Okay. Well, I'm going to say thank you, Bruce. I appreciate all the information. I thank you, Dan, for putting this together. And Bruce, I will probably be emailing you with some further questions when I think of them. Feel free, but generally, I think you should just plunge ahead and do it. Okay. And the torpedoes, you know. Bruce, we Good hope luck. you will join us on other Saturday sessions when we come up with our strange and diverse topics and conversations, because- uh, Oh, I will try. I, I often eat breakfast around 10 o'clock, and that's where I'm going to go right now. <laughs> this has been fun. This has Great. been a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce.
Yeah, Chris, I sent you a note in the chat regarding what you were just asking. I don't know if you got that or not. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Uh, I can't see the chat. Oh, sorry. Um, the caller that you were asked, that was John. John's a, a brand new caller. He's not actually calling for anybody at the moment. He's just learning uh, the mechanics, the choreography, the technical inside. He's got a very, very curious and insightful mind as far as learning to call. And um, he'll, he'll come up with things like that. It's not a matter of is it proper or is it improper or what's technical or what is not technical. He's asking because can I do this? And he's oh, yeah. and, 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 very, and, very and, sincere. And I, th I think it was, you know, I, I think it's a great thing because he's looking at things in ways and he, every now and then he comes up with ideas that just blow my mind. He does all the choreographic exercises that callers put up, all the stuff that Don used to put up, all the stuff that I put up. He's always into it. So, yeah. yeah well, uh, he, but, he should certainly be highly encouraged to, oh, absolutely. Uh, to be doing that. Um, but uh, there might be some other people who are wondering why I, why I don't like that particular yeah. thing no, either. I'm, and, I'm, uh, and, and it's more than that. It's, you know, well, what could you do with that and why and whatever. But uh, there's certainly things to talk about there. I haven't read Caller Lab definitions on it, but I always thought of it as starts with two couples facing, ends with them back to back, mm. plus the additional stuff that goes along with the definition. So that would eliminate his thing. There's any number of reasons um, why it's why it's kind of bogus, and, but they're interesting to talk about. And um, certainly, we don't want to discourage anybody from thinking about things like that. We just want to clue them as to exactly what that would be doing and what it wouldn't be doing. Chris, you've either got to get a new picture. I'm getting bored with that, or, or face the camera <laughs> and, and let us see your smiling reactions. So, oh boy, you, you don't want me to turn my camera on. <laughs> Well, last time I saw it, it was okay. Just because you had to climb into the screen to see it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Chris, Chris and I have been friends for just a little while, so I can pick on him. And uh, I actually did figure out how to set up a uh, uh, how to set the camera up so that I get the uh, the perfect angle without having to do the usual uh, look up or down things. However, um, the uh, the the background that you would see is. Uh, just uh, completely embarrassing, and, uh, I, and uh, my computer's not powerful enough to put the uh, fake background in. <laughs> uh. Oh, well. Actually, Don, very, very interesting comment you made because uh, it no longer says that. It, it says no the formation is a couple. It says uh -huh. active couples have an expectation fence facing other dancers at the end of the call, but. Um, Applications of lead right that lead dancers facing no one may be considered as unusual, but there's nothing that precludes it. So from the pure technical point of view, it says working as a unit as a single couple move forward along a 90 degree arc to face the couple or wall to their right. So right. But the but the but the but thing is, uh, it, it I, I would not use it. I, I'm in absolute agreement with you, Chris. But technically, there's nothing wrong with, with doing it. I mean, well, the, the, the thing that's technically wrong is that you're you can't be putting people in uh, formations that are undefined, and that's completely undefined at all levels. You could you could you could uh, conjure a formation at challenge uh, from which it would be legal, but just saying that to some people would be totally unfair. You can all, but you could always directionally call. You know, like heads pass through, lead to the right, and those couples, you know wrong way promenade and stand behind the sides but now you're doing directional calling and i think the international people might have an opinion about that yeah i have absolutely no problems with expecting dancers that that can dance to from starting facing lines to lead to the right and end in a trade by formation it's still mm -hmm. but that still starts with two couples facing and those couples back to back but oh, again, yeah I well, that one seems totally fine to me too, but the but the reason why is not so much because they are or are not facing it, but it's because they end in a in a in a defined place. Mm -hmm. And again, I learned the definitions back when there were no written definitions, and it was just a you learned what people did, and you had a gestalt for the for the feel of the call, and then when they started writing definitions to clarify things, they tried to. Put in writing what the gestalt was of the the average of people or average of people that cared and 
if you have questions about that, go back and listen to our session that Clark Baker did on the definitions. The, a lot of interesting, good stuff there. Maybe we'll <laughs> maybe we'll have a session without Clark and just just view that video again sometime. <laughs> Yeah, the one example they give in there is wheel and deal and lead to the right, which is not also something I wouldn't use, but from a yeah, wheel and deal is a terrible call. No, no, I mean <laughs> wheel and deal followed by a lead to the right, but don't you recognize humor? Come on, Will. Absolutely. No. <laughs> don't you recognize sarcasm? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was just thinking of that, Chris, and, and I, I personally would not use it, but then after reading this, I'm just thinking, for instance, if, if I did a heads pass through, lead to the right, girls take hands, now I've given a direction to, to move up there, and I could have girls cast three quarters, boys slide in, and then make concurrent stars using an old time figure or an exchange of the stars. There's all sorts of things you can do. I would not do that at uh, probably until challenge. Well, there, even even when you're doing yeah, that, with the, the directional example, prompts. But, so sorry, so now ahead. you have these people in these offset stars, yep. which is going to be and they'd uh, be working at angles. Yeah, so not really part of the uh, normal uh, call lab approved. Uh, yeah. You can call anything you want. I, I'm a big I'm I'm I, I believe me. I hate people telling me you can't do this, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and the caller can always call anything he wants directionally and whatever, but that's not in i hate to use the word legal but you know um it's not part of the it's, it's not, not part unusual. of the standard program by any means and it won't work in you know in all places depending on the language you know, speak I, I, don't get me wrong i'm in absolute agreement with you i don't think it would be wise <laughs> in any which way shape or form to do this unless you're doing something specific and you're giving a lot of directional prompting to do that kind of stuff, which to me is making the dancers work twice as hard for what you're trying to achieve, which has really no, no serious gain or benefit from it, because you can get the same interlocking stars with facing couples in a box and stepping to a wave or doing a beer to left and do the same thing. Well, Working that's, angles, that's, that's, for, that's for the caller's benefit. That's not for the dancer's benefit. I wouldn't do it. What I'm gathering from what you said, Chris, is just because you can't get Taminations to do it doesn't mean you shouldn't call it as long as your dancers can get through it and they enjoy the variety of it. Mm. And, yeah, and, well, it's and your original comment, Chris, that this is good conversation for another time and you should talk to John about it. But you guys can keep going. I think it's time for me to bow out too. Thanks again. See you next week, if not before. Bye. You know. Now, I, I just wanted to mention that it was uh, it was John Jurgens that had brought that up, but it wasn't a, a question of can I or, or why can't I? It was just a matter of is it okay to do this? And he was curious as to why, because he reads the definition and there's nothing, he's right, there's nothing in the definition that says don't do that. Well, I, I, I'd love to, to chat with him and anybody else about uh, exactly that sort of thing. And that's a, it's a, it's a really good example of uh, of uh, a number of uh, uh, things to talk about. So maybe we can, uh, uh, you know, hook him in. I, I was hoping that I could catch him before uh, before he escaped because I didn't. I didn't, after I objected, I felt like oh, he's really stomping on people. <laughs> yeah, now, he, he 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 does get defensive, but he is a very very he's a very clever man. He's a very smart man. And I don't think he takes offense in the way that most people take offense. He, he's just, he's genuinely curious and, and you're right. It, it does need to be encouraged. I can flick you his email address if you want to get in touch with him directly. Okay. Uh, can you email me his email address? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just double checking to see if I've got yours. <laughs> Got it. Done and done. Thank you, sir.
You're still at swing and circle, aren't you? Yes, indeed. Good enough. It's on its way to you. Thanks. Thanks. Well, everybody's quiet now. Yeah, I've never seen it like this. You're, you're muted, Yolanda. I said, I'm listening to you, but I'm, I'm drawing uh, diagrams at the same time. I think I'm going to bow out as well. I've got another session coming up at nine with uh, Matthew Mills on asymmetry. So I'll see you. Oh, is that going to be one of those uh, how to resolve uh, that one asymmetric square? Yeah. Oh, that's that. I'm going to go to that. That should be cool. I, I do yeah. that occasionally, but I, I haven't uh, made a real study of it. And uh, I bet I'll learn something. Well, Matt, Matthew, he gave this presentation at the Australian Collars Federation, but uh, at that one, it's like a, you've got a 20 minutes and then about 10 or 20 to 30 minutes and 10 minutes to talk. And then there's another presentation. And it was one that there was a lot of questions, and a lot of things that needed to be expanded. Why he did, you know, one of these at an at a diagonal right and left throughs, what it actually does when you only have the one square asymmetric. And I, I thought, I said, you know, that's a great presentation. There was a lot of questions, a lot of interest in it. A lot of people have been asking in my sessions about what do we do when we only have the one square broken down? How do we fix that without having him go if we see it? And I figured, well, I'll, I'll let Matthew know that. And uh, he's going to do the, the full presentation and be there for questions. So. That's uh, seven o'clock my time? Um, that depends. Where are you at? <laughs> I'm a, oh, I'm in the DC, so East Coast. Okay, so that would be uh, same as New York. Nine a.m. Washington. Seven o'clock. No, no, no. I, I mean uh, uh, Washington D.C., New York. Same thing. Seven o'clock tonight, Chris. Yep. Well, I hope to be there. No worries. Look forward to seeing you there. You got the link for it. I think, uh, yeah, I think actually, yeah, I'm on a mailing list or something that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's posted in the in the Facebook thing, but I can I can send it here if you want it or, or email it to you. I'm pretty sure I got something. The subject line is Mel Wilkerson is inviting you to. That would be it. Probably the one. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. And listen, Chris, if you want to do something on uh, what you can, but why you should not. Sounds like a great topic for a little bit later on on one of these sessions where you got lots of time. More than willing to have you there. Yeah, I might. Maybe I should uh, try to turn it into a uh, something a little more organized than the off the off the cuff. Yeah, well, I'd be more than willing. I've got the next well today and two more sessions booked, but be glad to have you if you want to talk about it because there's a lot of stuff like that where you know the definition lead right is a perfect example the definition says a couple or couples lead as a couple 90 degrees to face a right hand wall <laughs> that's it there's nothing else to it so i'll have to think of some more crazy examples that uh, uh would be that are more absurd that you could mm -hmm. do just based on reading the definitions and yeah i think i'll i'll probably be saying something like and we all know better than that but Let's talk about why. Yeah, and that's actually, I think, a great session. Let's talk about why. I think that's a great topic. <laughs> Let's talk about why or why not. Yeah. Sounds like you got a booking. Let me know. I will. I should learn to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, never. I, I, I actually, it doesn't matter to me if, if people get into heated discussions or they have different points of views, as long as they're respectful for each other. When they're talking square dancing and they're talking and learning about it or hearing and appreciating different points of view, something will sink. I learn stuff all the time uh, talking with people about what is good, what is, you know, things that I learn. I learn touch a quarter into a column followed by a Zoom. I never had a problem with it. It was very commonplace when I learned in Europe. Now it's considered terrible choreography without a circulate in place, but depends on where you're from, I guess.
anyway, I'm going to uh, pull pin here and uh, we'll catch some of you later. But yes, I will definitely be there. Bye. Bye. Yeah. We'll see y'all. See y'all around one place or another. Bye-bye.